Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Let's do it. Hi, guys. How Alexander became the Pharaoh. This is the third to last one. Uh, we have, uh, this is how he became Pharaoh. This series has had such good cliffhangers. Uh, Battle of Gagamela, and then uh, Battle of the Persian Gate. So let's do it. Original link, all the things. Description, hit all of them. Discord, join. Preemptive light, go. In our previous episode, Alexander the Okay. Okay. I had it on double speed. In our previous episode on Alexander the Great and his conquests, we detailed the Macedonian king's dramatic siege of the defiant Phoenician city of Tyre in 332. Through bravery, doggedness, and a generous quantity of engineering genius, the invaders broke the walls and took the island, joining it was so crazy. it with the mainland forever in the process. Rather than push in land in pursuit of the great king of Persia, Alexander would instead march south to the most ancient kingdom in the Hellenic imagination, Egypt. There, the Macedonian king would begin work on one of the most enduring marvels of his life and endure events that were to change his perspective on life forever. Welcome to our sixth video covering the Macedonian invasion of Persia, the conquest of Egypt, and how Alexander visited the famous desert oracle at Pay attention. Siwa. For your own life-changing events, you'll want to be looking and smelling your best, and the leading men's grooming it's provider, Manscaped, balls. now has an easy way to sort this out. Introducing the Make sure to use the uh, slash kings, guys. The Manscaped Ultra Premium Collection, an all-in-one shower set that has you literally covered head to toe. It's got five products to use in their five steps in five minutes routine. One, hit the shower with the Manscaped 2-in-1 shampoo and conditioner to nourish, hydrate, and revitalize your hair. Two, use the Manscaped body wash infused with aloe vera and sea salt to cleanse and moisturize at the same time. Three, dry off, then use the Manscaped Hydrating Body Spray for hydrated skin, even in hard to reach places, thanks to the 360 degree spray system. Four, apply the aluminum free Manscaped deodorant with their refined cologne scent. Five, use the free Manscaped Lip Balm to soothe and seal in moisture. And that's it. Five easy steps, all covered in the. This company has done real well, huh? I remember, like, the kind of first commercials that came out. They were pretty good, but they've gotten real good. Ultra Premium Collection, which is also vegan, cruelty free, and paraben free. How would... vegan? Veganism doesn't cease to confuse me. Opt in to their peak hygiene plan to make sure you never run out with hassle-free replenishment deliveries. Go to manscapes.com slash kings for 20% off plus free international... What do you care if, if something was made with the help of, like, egg yolks? Like, I, I, I thought veganism was like a... Like, a, like it, does, it doesn't go well with your body. Or like you, you don't like an, like animals dying, but a, a chicken egg, like no uh. shipping. Following the capture and destruction of Tyre in July of 332 BC, Alexander the Great so had once more rejected generous peace overtures yep. from Darius the Third, famously quipping, "That is what I should do were I Parmenian," hitting out at the underwhelming ambition of his right-hand man. The king didn't just want accommodation or riches now, he wanted the entirety of the Persian Empire, and perhaps beyond. The next objective was to the south, Egypt. As the Macedonian army, victorious in five major clashes since crossing into Asia, rushed into Palestine, it received the immediate surrender of every city in the region except one. That single defiant was Gaza, a formidable hilltop stronghold controlling the approaches to Egypt. Like Tyre, it too would have to be taken. Unfortunately for Alexander, Gaza's Persian governor Batis had been proactive during the siege on Tyre, taking the measure of hiring Arab mercenaries and stocking up his city with plentiful stores to withstand a siege of his own domain. The 160-mile march south through Phoenicia and Palestine was a harsh one, despite the lack of conflict. Refreshment was hard to come by, and the climate during the Near Eastern summer was incredibly arid. The army's salvation was the fleet element, commanded by Alexander's closest companion Hephaestion, which kept the advancing soldiers supplied with food and water. Ake, known during the Crusades as Akka, was passed first, followed by Joppa and Ascalon. This simple progress finally came to a swift halt when Gaza loomed large on the horizon in September of 332 BC. Alexander's army took up position opposite a section of the fortification on the southern side of the city, which the Macedonians considered weakest. 
Aiming to take advantage of subterfuge, the king ordered his engineers to begin mining beneath the garden walls, but to begin their work from far out of sight. At the same time, siege towers were ordered forward to distract Battis' garrison from the true threat beneath the soft earth. Due to the sandy and easily excavated ground surrounding Gaza, Okay, easily excavated ground surrounding Gaza, fine, but doesn't that also mean it's easily collapsed? And engineers, unsung heroes of history, of battles. So crazy. Sapping operations progressed rapidly. However, the siege towers had massive trouble rolling along such uneven hilly terrain due to the sand, which would frequently trap the wheels and cause delays. Constant jarring of this kind eventually caused the flooring within the towers to break apart, injuring soldiers and making further approach impossible. Reluctantly, as the sun was already close to setting, Alexander decreed that the army halts their assault for the evening. I mean, you, you, can, you can dig these things underground. Um, why not just, like, place a bunch of rocks in the sand? As many as you can. Clearly, the, I, I would say that might be too much work, but you're digging tunnels. Maybe because it's so arid and sandy, there aren't enough rocks. But, you know, why not just, like, place down as many rocks as you can, like, right before the uh, siege towers so that they don't, like, completely sink or something? Reluctantly, as the sun was already close to setting, Alexander decreed that the army halts their assault for the evening. After an uneventful night, before operations commenced, the king made a traditional sacrifice, asking for the god's aid. While the ritual was ongoing, it is said that a crow flew overhead and dropped a lump of dry mud on Alexander's head before taking a perch on the nearest siege tower, and this was viewed as a grim omen by the soldiery and their monarch. Alexander consulted his personal soothsayer, Aristander, who interpreted the event to foretell the fall of the city, but also harm that would come to Alexander during the clash. A person supposed to be able to foresee the, the future. He recommended that the army take no action that day, and as a sign of just how soon- I heard what he said, y y y yeah. Well, who interpreted the event to foretell the fall of the city, but also harm that would come to Alexander during the clash. He recommended that the army take no action that day, and as a sign of just how superstitious Alexander was, the king acquiesced. Deciding the passivity of their foes to be a sign of weakness, even if he wasn't superstitious, if his men are very superstitious, then he'd still have to think. Deciding the passivity of their foes to be a sign of weakness, Battis' mercenary Arab troops launched a brazen sortie out of the city gates in an attempt to destroy Alexander's siege towers and kill as many Macedonians as they could. Having taken the first of the enemy soldiers by surprise, Battis' Arabs initially met with some success and reached the towers with relatively little struggle. However, when Alexander caught on to what exactly was happening, he led his companions and hypaspists into battle from the front line, crashing into the spot where the fighting was fiercest. Companion the only thing I, w I wish I could know, like, just exactly how far, like he said when he started to notice, or, like, how far exactly is, is the distance here? But th that's asking for a bit much. ...of a little struggle. However, when Alexander caught on to what exactly was happening, he led his companions and hypaspists into battle from the front line, crashing into the spot where the fighting was fiercest. This decisive intervention stabilized the engagement and tipped the momentum towards the Macedonians. But the king was not going to escape unscathed, as the soothsayer had predicted. Quintus Curtius Rufus tells us of how one of Battis's hired swords pretended to be a deserter and threw himself before the king, asking for pardon. Alexander, always magnanimous, told the man to rise and be received. Thus able to get close, the Arab suddenly retrieved his sword and lunged at the king's neck. With athletic prowess, Alexander shifted to the side, avoiding the lethal blow, only to be wounded by an arrow in the shoulder almost immediately. The Macedonians... Oh, I, for a second I thought that was friendly fire trying to kill his ass potential assassin. ...shoved the Gazan defenders back inside the city. However, they retreated in high spirits. They're I wonder if Alexander ever greets someone like that again. ...morale buoyed by the Macedonian commander's apparent severe injury or death on the battlefield. Somewhat less to their liking, Alexander too was, despite his terrible wound, incredibly happy. Aristander had been correct. Harm had come to him, of course, but now the other prediction, that Gaza would soon fall, would surely come to pass. You see, this is where, uh, 
all of this um, foretelling stuff shouldn't make sense, okay, to these people. And that he's, he's like, cognitive dissonant. Like, how do you know that's, if this is all true and, like, the, the soothsayer was true, how do you know that was the only thing that you're going to be harmed by? So it's like a psychological thing. It's like, oop, I was just shot by an arrow. That means that must be the only time I'm going to get harmed in this whole siege, and it's a win. Ask. While the king recovered from yet another near miss that might have ended his life, he commanded his army to begin yet another monumental feat of engineering. In an arc around Alexander's siege lines, the earth was piled up and up over the course of several weeks until it created a mound that was as high as the escarpment on which the city sat. Onto that encircling artificial hillock was placed the heaviest Macedonian artillery that now could unleash devastating missiles from its new higher position. It I was going to say, dude, you're nuts, but he just connected an island to land, so that's, that's a piece of cake. It was now October. Two months after the king's initial investment of the city, he launched a withering bombardment from the mound, which cracked open a portion of the city walls and allowed his elites to breach them. Despite fearsome resistance, Alexander's army was not to be denied its prize. Gaza was taken, looted, and its male population... After the siege, of Batis refused to sub... After the siege, Batis refused to submit to Alexander with extreme rage. That. After the siege, Batis refused to submit to Alexander. With extreme rage, Alexander tied his legs with a rope behind a chariot and dragged his bot. Jesus. Okay, I'm thinking. I'm, I, this is a confusing sentence. Alexander tied his legs. I thought he meant his own. Okay. He refused to submit to him after it was over, and with rage, he tied his legs behind a chariot and dragged his body around the wall of Gaza, torturing him to death wiped out Screw. while the women and children were sold as slaves. Alexander finally crossed into Egypt now that the way was clear, reaching the gateway to the Nile, Pelusium, in just a week. When he and his army arrived, they were met not by a dogged garrison of defenders, but by a cheering crowd of overjoyed people who regarded the invading Macedonians as liberators. As the Romans would in a later age, the Persians had treated Egypt as an exploitable breadbasket for centuries, ruthlessly crushing unrest and suppressing the native religion. The Egyptians, in turn, reviled the Persians. The Achaemenid governor, Mezekis, realized his unstable position and received Alexander with friendship, granting the king open access to Egypt and its treasuries. From Pelusium, Alexander sailed up the Nile to Memphis, the ancient capital of the Nile Kingdom in its days of strength. In contrast to the first Achaemenid conqueror of Egypt, Cambyses, who is said to have profaned the divine Apis, Alexander showed himself as a friend by offering the god special sacrifice. Then, on November 14th, 332, the priesthood at Memphis placed the double crown of Upper and Lower Egypt, symbol of the pharaohs, onto Alexander's head and gave him the traditional scepter and flail. The ruler of Macedon was now also pharaoh of Egypt, god and king all at once, son of Ra and Osiris, Horus the Golden One, beloved of Amen. For a man who had always been curious about his potentially divine origins, given the words of his mother Olympias, the impact of this latest enthronement can hardly be understated. The new pharaoh departed Memphis in January of 331, sailing towards the Mediterranean until he reached Lake Merotis. There, inspired by the quality of the site opposite the island of Pharos, Alexander ordered that planning and construction efforts on a new city begin immediately. So enthusiastic was Alexander Alexandria about this new project that he supposedly designated the layout of the town and the limit of its defenses himself. That city would, over the next few decades, become Alexandria, the cosmopolitan capital of the ancient world. While his architects and laborers Lighthouse? continued preparatory work on the new Greece-facing city, Alexander found himself consumed by a sudden desire to visit a famous oracle of the god, Zeus Amon. This religious figure had previously been consulted by King Croesus of Lydia, Athens during the Peloponnesian War, and many other historical giants. It was seen with equal reverence to the oracle at Delphi. The problem was that this oracle resided within a desert oasis known as Siwa, fully 300 miles distant to the west. Alexander no doubt wished to discover more about his divine parentage, and the Siwa oracle was the perfect place to receive this godly information, what? given that the Egyptian Amen and Greek Zeus were generally viewed as different interpretations of the same god. It is said that during a war... Isn't that what kind of Islam and Christianity is, or Christianity and Judaism? Among the gods long ago, the Hellenic pantheon transformed into animals and fled to Egypt. Aphrodite, for example, was said to be Isis under another name. Other, less esoteric motivations were also present. 
a crucial stage of the campaign against Persia was upcoming, and divine backing would be a great boon. So did, 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 did that just say Aphrodites and Isis were believed to be the same person by Greeks? Setting out in late January with only a small band, among whom was the future Egyptian ruler Ptolemy, Alexander traveled 170 miles west along the coastal road and eventually reached the small settlement of Peritoneum on the borders of Karenaika. There, the adventuring king received a delegation of emissaries from Kareni. They granted him a number of grandiose gifts, including fine horses and chariots, and he concluded a treaty of peace and alliance with them. The party then continued on their way, turning inland from the Mediterranean. What followed was a grueling slog through the parched, desolate, and utterly inhospitable Libyan desert. I just have to go outside and turn these sprinklers on the uh, grass so that it doesn't die. I'll be right back. Oh, all right, good. Again, construction noises, thing to deal with. Spitable Libyan desert. The band's water supplies ran out four days into the venture, but they were saved by a great rainstorm that came just at the right time. Not content with just dehydrating the Macedonians, the desert then saw fit to disorient them as well. Camps in desert winds picked up, blasting away all landmarks in a withering sandstorm that made Alexander's guides lose their bearings. Finally, almost a month after setting out from Lake Mirotis, the party managed to follow a flight of birds to the verdant Siwa oasis, which they reached in late February 331. While the group remained behind and enjoyed the relative luxury of the oasis, Alexander went directly to the temple. The head priest, waiting for him, addressed the king as son of Amen, good god, lord of the two lands, and then ushered him inside. As Arian puts it, Alexander then put his question to the oracle and received the answer which his heart desired. Since not a single person, except Alexander, was permitted entry, nobody truly knows what the king heard in that temple, but whatever it was, left an irrevocable and... Imagine Alexander left the temple and... He was like, oh, he told me I am the king of everyone and I'm God. And they went in and they just like found him dead. <laughs> and he's like, just trust me. No, of course the Oracle, guys, did they really? Okay. Yes. Mm, you have, you have an army that can crush everyone and kill everyone in my family. Hmm. I see. Yes. What do you want? Yes, you are. Just, <laughs> just. I'm sorry, just how, I wonder if they knew, like, okay, I, I don't know anything else that these other people don't know, but they have this title, and, and, or if they, like, really were convinced that they had these special powers, I don't know, okay. Permanent impact on him. Plutarch, writing almost half a millennia later, tells us that Alexander, upon gaining entry, asks the Oracle whether or not the murderers of his father had been punished for their crime. To this, the Oracle responded that the king ought to guard his tongue, since his father was indeed a mortal and therefore could not die. The implication is quite clear. Alexander the Great was the son of Zeus Amen and therefore a divine being in his own right. There are several other tales in the ancient sources concerning this consultation, but they are likely also speculation. Sometime after entering, Alexander exited the temple and was met by his companions, to whom he would tell none of the details about what had been revealed. Would they have spoken a sort of Arabic? How old is Arabic, the language? Huh, what would they have spoken? ...to him. After rewarding the Siwa shrine with plentiful gifts of gold, the party returned to the... I'm talking about people in Egypt, obviously. After rewarding the Siwa shrine with plentiful gifts of gold, the party returned to the embryonic city of Alexandria by the route they had come. The first indications of spring were now upon the Macedonians. After the relatively simple foray into Egypt, it was nearly time to resume the campaign against Darius III. Before the Titans locked horns again, however, there were important administrative matters to conclude. Leaving the great work at Alexandria in the capable hands of his builders, engineers and architects, Alexander sailed south to Memphis, where he was once again infatuated by the ancient city's air of quasi-divine pharaonic majesty. The monarch was fawned on by his Egyptian subjects as though he was a deity on earth, and artists began depicting their new beloved ruler on temple walls across the country. Peter Green implies that Greek emissaries actually began to understand Alexander's change in personality and a newfound love for oriental divinity, realizing He's, this is, I feel like this is the, the beginning of the end of his sanity. Um, that's your fault. That was a Discord notification. Not my fault.
Um, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah. So how how does how, what happens between Alexander and Cleopatra? You know, I wonder. So it's cool that Cleopatra must have been extremely well aware of who Alexander the Great was, like very well aware, because he was. Uh, that it could be exploited for their own ends. Several embassies of Greeks were waiting for the king as I'm saying like he must have been a very famous figure to her. You know? That's and that's cool. Realizing that it could be exploited for their own ends. Several embassies of Greeks were waiting for the king at Memphis with petitions, all of which Arian tells us were generously granted. It is tempting to say that their flattery might have swayed the king, but it is equally possible that a mix of success and elation at the Siwa revelation had Alexander in a good mood. Beyond mere emotion, Alexander also had a more pragmatic motivation to begin treating the Greeks more gently at the beginning of 330. Guys, where, where, where does this helmet come from, this helmet thing? I see it all the time. Like a, like a crashing wave helmet. The one to see people. Right, Alexander sorry. also had a more pragmatic motivation to begin treating the Greeks more gently at the beginning of 331. As feared, Persian assistance had allowed Sparta's King Agis III to start making trouble at home. Throughout Alexander's time in Egypt, Agis had managed to take over most of Crete and stood poised to attack the mainland with a large mercenary force. The situation was a volatile tinderbox just waiting to be lit, and being unduly harsh Harder. to other Greek states seemed likely to make the situation explode more violently. Alexander paid special attention to the governance of Egypt, which he immediately viewed as both a plentiful cornucopia and a potential threat. It had presented two primary threats to occupying empires in the past, nationalist rebellions by disaffected natives and attempts by devious governors to leverage Egypt's supreme strength in revolt against the larger empire. The king now set out a number of reforms aimed at avoiding both of these nightmare scenarios. He separated the Nile Kingdom's administration into civil and military branches. Routine day-to-day -day bureaucracy remained in the hands of local Egyptians, a move which gained Alexander the favor of the locals. Not only that, but if those same bureaucrats began making a mess of things, the population wouldn't blame him. The traditional geographical division of Upper and uh, no marks, great chief in Greek, or as the Egyptians called them, Herit Tep A A. Herit Tep A. Were provincial governors in Egypt. The practice started at least 3,000 years before Alexander arrived in the city. My God. And Lower Egypt was also employed, with a district governor known as a nomarch serving as steward over each segment. Geographical divide and rule tactics of this kind were also used on the military front, although Greeks were employed rather than Egyptians. The country's eastern and western districts would be commanded by Cleomenes of Nacretis and Apollonius, son of Carinus, respectively. Macedonian garrison commanded, although huh? Greeks were employed rather than Egyptians. The country's eastern and western districts would be commanded by Cleomenes of Nacretis and Apollonius, son of Carinus, respectively. Macedonian garrison commanders were also instituted at Memphis and Pelusium in order to keep So prior to this, were there never was there never a Greek pharaoh? Because I know Cleopatra is, has Greek org or order in the delicate, fertile, and often revolt prone breadbasket that was Egypt. With matters of governance finalized, Alexander took his whole army back north to Tyre. In the Achaemenid heartland, Darius had been using the time since his defeat at Issus to gather a fresh, even more numerous force to throw Alexander back. This army was made up of a multitude of peoples from every realm of Asia still under Persian control, including India, Scythia, and Bactria. Predominant among the Persian aristocracy was Bessus, governor of Bactria, who not only brought to bear a powerful force, but also possessed kingly ambitions. The stage was set, and the curtain was about to rise on the final great battle between Macedon and Persia, the Battle of Gorgamela. And our video on that battle is on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. It helps him. Ah, no. Awesome video as always. Um, as you, this is the first time I did one in 1.25 speed. Believe it or not, it, and I've said this, you know, it, it helps me. It, it keeps my mind from being able to wander off, and so antithetically, it it actually helps me pay attention. But if you guys don't like it too, too much, and or a lot of you don't like it, then I'll just switch back. No big deal. Awesome. Next episode coming up. He's turning full megalomaniac, it seems, and I'm excited for that, to see how that ends. I'm really surprised that with only one episode left, or two episodes.
that we have not even gotten that we're still so uh west like we're still on the mediterranean and and i thought at this point we'd be more there'd be more like battling uh towards the east but clearly it'll get into those in the next two episodes hope you're all doing well chin up if not you'll be good soon emotions are fickle my friend bye guys